Hey, well, good morning. Hey, is it pretty there? Like for some reason, we're having some. Uh, so, do I do I have you? Am I force muting you guys? No, oh, there we are. You were force muting. We have since yes, muted. All right. I apologize for that. I know it's uh, it's, it's difficult there, but uh, I think we should extend a warm greeting to Mr. Nelson, who's joined us live and in person. I know that he enjoys a, a personal greeting, so. Hello, hello, hello to uh, Mr. Mike Nelson and also to Mr. Eric Riz. Well, let's, I'll, I'll do the official kickoff here. Neil says he's having technical issues. I haven't heard from Sean or Sherry or Sharon, so I don't know what's happening. Or Hal, what's going on with Hal? I Hal said, actually, Hal did email and said he'd be a few minutes late. Okay. Well, uh, hello and welcome to episode 53 of the Microsoft 365 Office Hours. And we'll be discussing, of course, everything Microsoft 365 related and answering questions from the community. My name is Christian Buckley. I am the uh, an Office Apps and Services MVP and Microsoft Regional Director. And also, and there's Neil. And also the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director at AvPoint. And joining me today are Mr. Eric Riz, founder and CEO of Empty Cubicle and Office Apps and Services MVP based out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, Mike Nelson, a solutions architect with Pure Storage and a cloud and data center management MVP. So we dump everything that's non-SharePoint related goes in Mike's lap. <laughs> and yeah. So he's based in Appleton, Wisconsin, and we have Neil's chin and neck. And that yeah. would be yeah. <laughs> and Mike Nelson. Microsoft Anything. Senior Program Manager, Dr. Neil Hodgkinson. Oh, so you're not able to get in on the uh, the app at all, so you resorted to the to the phone? Um, I'll switch to it. I'm having some problems with my laptop, but I'll switch ah. to it and get it working. Okay. And I I know, so Hal's going to be late. We have, uh, we, we're not sure we're being ghosted by Sean, apparently. And uh, Sherry and Sharon may drop in. We might have a few other folks drop in here. So, uh, but besides that, hello, everybody. Good morning. Hey. Hello, all. I've missed you all terribly. Oh, another email from a, a supposed panel member, Mr. McDonough. What does he claim now? It's quite long, but I, oh, I wow. think the, the general gist of it is he's not here, which is plainly <laughs> obvious <laughs> for those who are here. Thank you. Well, but yeah. now we have the documented, uh, you know, the history for the historical records. Um, so we'll we'll file that in our paperwork, yes. and with the uh, with the powers that be and let them know. Tardy. Yeah. So this is yeah. well. This is it's it's great to have everybody. I know that there's a lot going on. Um, we're end of quarter. People are busy. End of fiscal year. Eric was talking about with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, government in the government sector. They've got the end of their fiscal year. A lot happening there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so, and then next week, and we will not be back next week because we've got uh, something for, for all of us MVPs. And Neil, I don't know if you're participating at all, but the MVP Summit is happening next week. I'm, I'm not. I've not been invited. Oh, no. I would definitely take that personally. I can yeah. probably send an invite. <laughs> I don't yeah. give it. But it's uh, and hopefully this is our. You know, I, I, it's great having uh, you know the the resource to be able to log in from the home. But what happens with a lot of these events is it's it's difficult to carve off your time for a multi-day online only event, and so I, I I'm just I'm not able to get as much out of it because I'm working. And, and I really hope they improve the process too because I don't know if you remember last year's. But we were like the testing point for, you know, the beginning of COVID and the whole virtual thing, because we were like one of the first big events yeah. for Microsoft to be virtual. And, you know, hey, throw Teams into the mix, which 
a lot of people hadn't used, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I know people have now gotten used to it and they understand it. And if Ignite is any kind of a, you know, indicator of how hopefully the summit goes, then <clears throat> we should be okay. But we'll see. Yeah. Well, I think that generally it's it's more of a representation of conferences, whether in person or online, that are an issue for people who need to be doing other things while they are out of the office, whether whether in person or online. If you're if you're online and that you know little green dot shows up to show your you are online, available, available. I know. People, yeah, people are going to ping you, and you'll yeah. be expected to respond. And it, it's just the broader conversation around availability of time and lack thereof. You know, yeah, here's here, here's a real world example of that. So, so my entire office is down in my basement here, and and it's just we're empty nesters. So it's just my wife that works and comes home midday. She's like, well, I never know when you're available down there. And I said, so I bought one of those colored remote control colored light strings. And I was gonna put it in the stairwell, and uh, she's a a visual designer, so she's just like, you're not putting colored Christmas lights up in in my house. Like, no. Ooh. I'm like, I said, but almost every day she comes home, like, and she's just like, I don't know if I, so like, I need to ask you some questions, and I don't know if I can come downstairs and do that. But that's, yeah. uh, so it's kind of the opposite effect, where she'll do nothing, you know, at all times, because she she doesn't know. And I've offered to solve that with that, the, the, the colored lights, and she said <laughs> no. Well, and that's from a family perspective, but I mean, also work. Because, I mean, I, I told them, I told work that I, you know, next week I'm going to be at MVP Summit, right? Yeah. And that means very little to, to, to anyone but me <laughs> um, in terms right. of, oh, yeah, he's not, he's not on a plane and he's not actually physically sitting in a hotel room or going to a conference hall where, you know, be really, you know, there's so many other distractions. There's so many, you know, networking in terms of meeting people in the hallways and talking to people and getting together in, in groups like we always do, um, being able to walk around the campus and all that other kind of stuff we do during summit. Um, but now it's like, oh yeah, he's just sitting at home. You can, you can bother him. You know? <laughs> he's available. I was yeah, going to say, he's Mike, Mike, so, Mike, so what you're saying is uh, as the business, this isn't costing us any money. Yeah. We don't have to put him up in a hotel. He's nope. not traveling anywhere. He's available nope. 24 seven ping him. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, you're getting quality output from Mike while he's oh, yes. engaged in oh. videos and he's getting a tremendous amount of knowledge out of those systems while he's trying to work at the same time. So it works out for everybody. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, no, it hey, doesn't. <laughs> we're joined by Sherry Oswald. So a Microsoft certified trainer, Microsoft office master and co-founder of power up learning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Hello, Sherry. Sherry is muted, but she, she sounds muted. great, and she will sound great momentarily. I sound great momentarily. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry, I had a call that ran a little bit long, so but no happy worries. to be here. We have uh, Hal joining late, and I is Sean joining at all? Or did he bail on us? I have to say he was quite unclear. He was okay. very he's, unclear whether he he's bailing. He starts his email. Or... Yeah, he yeah. starts his email saying, "Sorry, I'm a no show right now." Yeah, and right now it would imply that he might show later. But that's wide open. He, well, as we all know, how much of a drama queen Sean can be. So, <laughs> yeah. that's. Oh, oh so I'm we'll, totally. We'll totally see what and, he's and he's that's not going here in the, to defend himself. So that's going not. in the back pocket for later use, right yeah. there. And I know that, and Sharon has like a recurring customer meeting, and I'm sure she'll try and drop in a little bit later as well. But we'll jump into it. We're, so, we are going to. We've got some folks that are watching us on the live stream. Um, feel free to post your questions out uh, on Facebook. You can go and find us at a couple that's been shared out in a couple different places. Um, but uh, otherwise, we've got a bunch of questions that you can ping us on various social media. Go and find us and, uh, and, and let us know, and we'll address, uh, if not today, then in the next episode, which will be in two weeks, since we won't be doing it next week. Um, but let's kick things off. But we always like start starting off with uh, Mike. What's the latest with the message center updates? Oh man, I got to tell you, it was a busy week for Microsoft. I don't know what they're doing, man, but they're pushing everything out. It's like the message center updates were like, you know, they went on forever. So I'm only going to cover, you know, uh, some of the highlights. They're just trying to get uh, stuff out there before the MVPs are looking 
uh, closely at it next week? Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, probably, probably. But I got to tell you, there's, you know, <clears throat> usually when they have a lot of updates, it's updates around timing. So they always, you know, are alter, altering timelines, whether it's, you know, this timeline has been pushed forward, this timeline has been pushed back. But it's not like they're announcing anything new. They're just changing timelines. Yeah. Um, for some reason, in the last week, they've had a lot of new stuff, not just timeline shifts or updates. It's a lot of new stuff. So I'm sorry. Right. Did you say did you say timeline shifts? Yeah, you, you did, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I did. I, I that's just a good. Shifts. It's a good clarification. All right. Was, Can we have the disclaimer was, first? It was oh, very that's quick, right. and yes. I just wanted to be clear. There we go. So the um, the disclaimer for those that are watching the live stream, um, obviously not showing up. I have to do a little bit of magic in the recording here okay. for the just there. But it is up on screen for those that are watching via the live stream, where we do um, clarify that uh, – <coughs> All of our advice is provided as is, and uh, I like to read this. The views and opinions expressed in this live stream are provided as is by the participants who are experts uh, on some Microsoft technologies, but do not claim to be experts in all Microsoft technologies. I know Neil I like, might make that claim, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to add to that if I could. We need to add some content. Sure. And just add a sentence around accidental profanity if that ever happens. You know, we're not liable for that. That's right. He said uh, it was the the word was shifts. We shifts. clarified hey. that that you said. So hey. all, all accidental profane language is deemed to be a slight and merely made out of passion and commitment yeah. to our dedication to the platforms and products which we. But have what happens? What happens when I'm accidentally not on mute and I call Christian a name? Well, that depends on what name you call him. Well, That's that right. would be a profanity. <laughs> <laughs> we do it because we care. I know. Yes, we do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All right. All right. Let's go. Um, yeah. Prevent attendees from sharing video feeds in Teams is here. So meeting organizers can presenters now be able to prevent attendees from turning on their camera to share video. So... Hey, remember those Zoom bombs? Well, you got team bombs, right? So yeah. now you can actually shut it off so you won't have any team bombs. And, uh, you know, there's a couple different ways of doing it. So um, the thing that I'm not really understanding, though, is that you need to set all this before the meeting happens. You can't actually set it when you've already started the meeting, which, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Maybe it's something limitation around you know, the architecture or the code or whatever, but they really got to try and make it so, hey, oh, yeah, we just had somebody turn on their video. I got to make it so they can't, no one can turn on their video. Well, no, you have to stop the meeting, restart it, you know, change the setting and then restart it. Uh, okay. Then they, they finally added that for like the um, lobby, you know, because sometimes, you know, I don't want people in there before I'm starting, but then once I've started, I don't want to mess with the lobby. So I think right. they finally did change it to where you can now admit people. So it'd be nice if they added that as well. But, yeah. yeah, I saw that this morning. Um, the PowerPoint Live is going to be in is in Teams. It does a slide translation now. So now you can actually, you know how you have translator and you can have the, the captions across the screen um, during a PowerPoint Live. Now it'll translate... Uh, automatically into a language language that the user selects so they can automatically select if they're listening you know to someone giving a us from the us they can change it to you know german or whatever language they like in order to to watch the translation which is which is really getting to that whole adaptability you know diversity and inclusion adaptability type of of uh solution which i i am which 100%. is a really cool feature. You just remind reminder to people though, you have to have, be using the cloud version of PowerPoint. For yes, that that's correct. PowerPoint Live. Yes. So that because uh, the Microsoft Translator has been out there for years. In fact, I talked about. It, I think it was back in 2012 to 2014, somewhere around that time frame. Uh, so I helped organize SharePoint Saturday Sacramento, and we had some uh, Spanish speakers uh, in the audience there. And so we had a, a several sessions that were uh, uh, primarily Spanish speaking. And I did a session where I used the Microsoft Translator and, and it worked reasonably well. So uh, you know, I was giving my presentation, I had Translator open, they were sitting there looking at their laptop 
and it was but pulling my my audio and and making the 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 translation right there live so they were sitting there listening with head, yeah. with headphones and it pretty much worked um so now we have that built in to powerpoint live which is pretty cool right. and it's getting better i mean all that translation stuff and getting better it's just dealing with different you know when we sat in a session for cognitive services um, with the pms for cognitive services they were telling us you know it's all about voice attenuation you know and when they're trying to recognize uh different attenuations of the voice not only that but also um different slang that's used and things like that and trying to interpret it it's 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 like an art and a science together it's kind of both you know to do that and i think i think it's pretty cool uh, moving on more in teams. Now you can actually take uh, the uh, usage reports from teams and you can de-identify the person or personally identifiable information, PII information out of the reports. That was something I think we had a question on like three months ago or four months ago in, you know, in our, uh, our uh, webinar here, they, they actually, somebody asked about that. Hey, how can I take that PII information out of reports? Well, it's finally here. So the global admin can can uh, take that information out, and uh, it's based on anonymization setting available in the admin center. Very cool. Yeah, um, and another one about Teams. Teams is just kind of like on a roll in the last week. Um, anybody heard of Ramp? R A M P. The government ramp. No, that's Fed Ramp. Um, so, and yeah. it's called you know you have to use Fed Ramp together. That's a whole government thing. Um, if you dealt with government work, you know that, <clears throat> Christian. Uh, but uh, ECDN, there's an ECDN called Ramp that's used in enterprises, um, and uh, Microsoft is actually integrating that into Teams. So now you use you use the Enterprise Content Delivery Network ECDN Ramp, okay, in live events for Teams. Now, I took a look at this because I've never used Ramp. I, I didn't know what it was, but I took a look at this and. It's a video delivery system is what it is. And it's, it even says in this notice, it says the industry standard for video content delivery within the enterprise is being integrated into Teams. Now, take a step back from that. What does that tell you? Why is Microsoft putting a third party enterprise video content delivery system into their collaboration product when they have their own video content delivery platform. Hmm. <laughs> Nobody has any comments? Really? Okay. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, buy that Microsoft stock, you know, buy that, yeah, buy that, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Oh, and by the way, so we are, uh, well, it's disappeared there on the screen there, but we have been joined by Hal Hostetler, and um, let me scroll up to this. So he's a senior field engineer with Roland Shore and Tower in Tucson, Arizona, and another Office Apps and Services MVP. But there's a lot of those. So, you know. <laughs> Time a dozen. Those are yeah. All right. I've got two more things, and I don't know, get out of everybody's way. Um, on the Exchange side, uh, you know, there's always been an issue with quarantine messages in Exchange. And I've run into this with with customers where they're like, hey, how do I get the employees not have to call the help desk every time they want one of these quarantine messages released? Well, finally, Microsoft is allowing for employees to release their own quarantine and uh, being able to do that. Previously, admins, the admins were unable to alter the end user access for messages quarantined by the policies. Now they have a new end user release workflow hmm. where you know, end users can actually do their own thing with the quarantine message and nothing has to be directed to admins or global admins. So that's kind of big. And then also to add on to that, you can do customization of the quarantine notification. This is something that got, I mean, I remember this being asked back like in the Exchange 2012 days um, or Exchange 2000 days is how do I customize? How do I, because we don't, we want to be able to put our company logo on a quarantine message so people, the employees don't think it's another phishing message. Because right. some of those quarantine messages look like fishy, fishy messages. So <clears throat> now they're going to allow that. You can do customizations of the quarantine notifications um, with the <clears throat> logo, display name, and a disclaimer. So I think that's definitely a step forward. I'm just 
you know, I don't know why it took them 10 plus years to get to this point, but it is what it is. And the last thing I want to ask is, does anybody use that focus mode in Outlook? Does anybody use focus mode at all? And do you? Do you uh, find that yeah, really helpful, Riz? Let me ask you, do you find that really helpful? Yes, I do. Thank you for asking. Okay. Yeah. I'm just I, wondering because I have never found it helpful. I'm, I'm so a big fan of... Sadly, uh, have I. Another view? Okay. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of distractifications and turning them off. Yeah. So, I totally okay. I totally agree. And then you have to train it, though. That's what people don't yeah, understand yeah. is it doesn't work right out of the box perfectly. You have to train it. Right, and I get right. so many webinar announcements and newsletters and all that goes to the other. And, yeah, it saves okay. me. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> cool. Well, the only reason I bring that up is because I've never really enjoyed it in Outlook. I've never really implemented it. I always thought it was kind of like a pain because I wouldn't see everything that I needed to see. But now they're bringing it to SharePoint pages. So now you're going to have a share a focus mode uh, for uh, SharePoint pages that allow the authors, page authors and viewers to focus on a greater amount of page content by hiding, you know, pieces of SharePoint. So they're getting to the point and there's actually something, a little tidbit in the, the notification is saying, hey, we're not we're getting rid of the visuals that which get you to more to focus on what's there, but then they're going to take it a little bit further down the road and get more into i don't know more into the you know what they do with the, an inbox focus in outlook they're going to try and focus the content that you see on your sharepoint site well it'd be interesting I, i'm sure then teams can't be far behind if they're doing that over on the sharepoint side because i'd actually really appreciate that i mean it, it's you have the ability to go in and pin at which mm -hmm. which i do but even then, you're getting the notifications for all these things which are really not relevant to me directly, but I there's activity that's happening because of the, to go in and refine the subscriptions. If there can be applied some intelligence to that, say like Christian's not mentioned, he's yep. you know he, he's, he's a member of, and highlight that there's something new here, but I don't need to notify him for all of these things. I think that there's some, definitely some work that can be done there for teams. Jerry, do you think it'd be that would be a good thing for from the SharePoint perspective, being able to, because as you bring up a SharePoint page, you have a, everything that the, I mean, the, everything in the kitchen sink that the creator wants you to see, which and necessarily that's the problem. <laughs> may yeah. not appear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the it's the designer. So I just um, did a communication site and using audience targeting and communication sites um, for. GlobalCon last week and you know they try and throw everything up there on one page and yeah. don't understand and my analogy I always use is, is you break it up like the newspaper you know if you want to find out how the, your favorite basketball team did this weekend you don't you don't look at the whole newspaper or you don't make the page 20 feet long you you make targeted areas and then you know to me that's kind of like audience targeting but I mean, each person can decide what they want to see instead of the person designing the page want to see. But I'm interested to see how they come up with that algorithm. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to be all AI, right? Everything, it's yeah. all going to be based off of AI and what, you know, how long you spend looking at something, you know, how many clicks you do on a page, all that kind of stuff. They're collecting all that telemetry data. So, yeah. Well, it, and it kind of goes back to, I don't know if you've seen the social dilemma, but they talk, you know, the algorithm yeah. that for Facebook and all of that. Yeah. I wonder if they're using that same type of um, oh, no logic doubt. behind it. But yeah. It'll be interesting. <laughs> there. Yeah. Well, well I Mike. That means I need to go back and explore focus mode. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> seriously, on Outlook, I had it on for about five minutes and decided this ain't for me and turned it off. I guess I did not give it a fair enough trial. Yeah, you gotta you gotta train it. You gotta say this is fluff. This is important. This is fluff, and eventually it catches on. So, yeah, yeah. very a very nice little paper out there that helps you with that. Just out of curiosity, uh, I didn't paper see one, but then I haven't looked. Well, you know how to train. Well, the thing you gotta be careful of how is you. you <laughs> How to train yeah. your dragon. I think you gotta be careful. Uh, yeah. You don't you, you don't want you don't want to miss that email that tells you you've won like you you inherited ten million dollars from yeah. some long lost uncle in, in the middle of Africa, right? Yeah, <laughs> don't lose that one really email. Nice I just my, wish, my uncles just won't stop emailing me. I have the same problem. <laughs> I just wish I didn't have to create all these robust spam rules for all the 
weird thing. Yeah. It's like, how many times do I have to say, I don't want to hear about this particular topic and, yeah. you know, warrant like car warranties. And, yeah, <laughs> car <laughs> warranties and different, you know, male anatomy parts that apparently are should be a focus in my life. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I don't know I, what I, you, know, you are referring to. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in the same boat, I, man. Yeah. I'll leave it to your imagination. You have to subscribe to it in the first place. As, yeah. as Krishna reminds us, you know, this is a P, this is a family friendly it's a, it's a family uh, forum. Show. We try to. So I would say that uh, you know that uh, the foul language is acceptable if suddenly you find that you've lost a limb, for example. <laughs> Yeah. If you're bleeding or dying, it's it okay. normally doesn't happen in an online panel discussion about technology, but could happen. I just want to leave that out there. That you know, anything can happen. That's right. <laughs> well, let's jump into the community questions and uh, see what we have going on. This is some interesting questions here. I've tried to uh, mix it up a bit with the topic areas. And uh, we'll see uh, if we're able to get through. There's a couple of SharePoint ones in here. And we don't have uh, Sean here uh, to to dump them on him. Uh, but let's start with the question number one. Steve asks, uh, so, oh, this is timely. That's why I put it up front. Of course, last week, those that watched the show remember that there was an <laughs> urgent <laughs> question where somebody needed an answer before 9 a.m. <laughs> and I, I, but this time, uh, no, not really. Um, Steve asks, uh, with the outages, the issues this week, what does everyone have for a backup plan to continue to meet during these? This outage hit when we were supposed to have a two-day conference for our executive leadership. Ouch. Luckily, last week they rescheduled it to a few weeks from now. This would have happened at an extremely bad time had they not moved on it, uh, moved it. So do any of you have any con contingency plans for something like this? I'd love to hear them. Uh so everybody, everybody on the panel know what happened last week. Did you did you get the emails on the the root cause analysis the RCA if, we did on it? Yeah. So if you if you were using Teams or if you were using uh, so what was hit? What oh. was the scope of it? it no, it, probably it, was, went it, it probably went to my other <laughs> inbox. It probably went to my other. It was the focus <laughs> inbox issue. That's right. Sure. I couldn't I couldn't get my email. It was down. Yeah. It <laughs> actually had it actually has to do around authentication. So it didn't just affect Teams. You know, it, it affected authentication as a whole. There was a new authentication. If you're if you're on the security deals, um, you know, they sent out an RCA analysis that they did on it. And basically what happened is that they made a change and the change didn't stick very well um, and they had to back it out. And in order to back it out, um, it took a long time to back it out. So it, they actually implemented it. And you have to understand the way things are implemented across you know, Microsoft's cloud platform, it's not like they 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 can they implement in sections. It's like they they start a they start a pipe and they start flowing stuff out of a pipe and it just starts hitting all these different areas, right? And it, when they have to back something out, they have to back it out the same way it came in. So it's like backing out a change. And that took longer than actually, you know, propagating the change. Um, so it was it was around authentication. It didn't just affect Teams. It affected a, a multitude of services. Azure Portal, uh, you couldn't access things like that. Um, but the gist of it is, it was an authentication change. Didn't work out so well. Uh, they had to back it out. That took a you know a couple of hours. Kind of really pissed people off. Um, but from a contingency standpoint. The only way you'd really be able to get around this is if you used a different provider at that point, because you can't do anything with Microsoft services at that at that point. You're, you, it's it's you don't have the ability to do anything from a cloud perspective, from Microsoft's perspective. You have to, you know, say, okay, we're switching the entire conference over to Zoom, you know, or something like that. That's pretty much the only the only contingency plan I can think of, or you know, reschedule. It's just the the reality. It's, you know, I just to so people relate a few years back. Um, I was uh, doing uh, demos for um, uh, for former company, and I, I had uh, was just doing a, a it was like an open invite demo of our software and talking about kind of the business space around it, and had some uh, had a, a senior executive from uh, one of the largest global uh, consulting firms that is a 
Microsoft uh, kind of co-founded hint hint who that is. Uh, anyway, so I had uh, so here I am. I'm doing starting on the demo. Like five minutes into it, my internet goes down. In fact, I, if I recall, it, it may have been my power went out in the house. So of course I immediately get on my phone, call my team because I had a couple of folks that were on that call. Call them and let them know what's going on. And then I, uh, you know, via phone, I send an email to all of the registrants. And I do it as fast as I can on your phone to go and find that information. We were using WebEx, I think, to go in there and pull the you know, to, to log in via your phone and to, to get access to that. Anyway, so it took a few minutes to reach back out. But this VP was incensed at how unprofessional I was for having dropped with no notification the, the webinar for the product demo and called in and complained to multiple people in my company about me, about how unprofessional this was. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, are you going to notify when your power goes out? Oh, yeah, just a minute, guys. My power's about to go out. Correct. So it was, you know, there's just the, the lack of understanding. And so I actually had somebody at that company, more junior, like, uh, who uh, apparently he, he went and did like a blacklist type thing, like, never work with this Christian Buckley at this vendor, you know, kind of thing internally. And this friend, like, went in and, and stopped all of that explain what happened but but what kind of an a-hole are you to do like that kind of things but my my point is though besides that that just real you know d move i'm start i'm trying hard to keep it all pg here as keep you the see. profanity man but, uh, I to but, uh, got my finger on the button christian you, you, you do go for that's it right. that's why we have beep, a five beep, second delay beep, 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 beep. no that's that's the extent of my of my language but the uh you know, but I think what has happened over the last few years is people have become more understanding of those kinds of technical issues or the dog barking, you know, as we're working from home or a last minute change because a child needs to be picked up from school because of a schedule change or so, whatever it is. Like people are much more understanding of of the things that happen. So like as a backup plan, like, yeah, if you have to meet like right then, right there, Microsoft services go down, you've got other third party solutions in place. Um, a week ago, my internet went down. Again, I was it was out for the entire day. It was construction team cut into the fiber cables, you know, it, for our entire neighborhood. So um, thousands of, of homes lost their internet coverage for the the entire day. And so I did what I could via my phone. But the best thing to do, my backup plan recommendation is reschedule. Mm -hmm. Service goes down, reschedule. So yeah, the other way to, the other way to think about it, Christian, like you say, you know, as much as I, you know, I work, I work for the Azure product group, right? I'm in the Azure product group at Microsoft. We actually also, well, I work a lot with my customers where they they are multi-cloud, right? So like you said, you know, use Teams goes down, use Zoom, switch back and forth if, if necessary. I work with customers all the time that have their, they have secondary platforms or even primary platforms on AWS and Azure's the secondary or the, or the backup. So think about that as well as, as, you know, that's kind of, that's how we, we, we work with customers all the time. Yeah, of course we want everyone on the Microsoft cloud, but it's in one basket uh -huh. isn't always the right, the right choice. Yeah. Yeah. And when everything yeah. is tied together, I mean, when you have an outage, it, it you know, take example, we had an outage, what, six months ago with storage out of Texas, um, where one of the DCs in Texas had a storage outage that caused all kinds of mayhem, but it only affected, it only affected certain regions and it only affected certain services where this authentication actually affected a massive amount of people because the authentication is centralized. So it's a little bit, you know, thinking of it that way, um, it, it's something you, you know, how do you, how do you prepare for that? You can't, I mean, yeah. there's, there's, there's no way. Well, it's, it, you know, when, when dealing with, with, you know, web conferences, depending on the audience, again, it's, it's a little bit different if you have an all day event planned and there's a major outage. And if there's no day, like, you, what can you do, but, but reschedule yeah. that. Next um, week, if, summit, I mean, right. whatever, MVP summit, all of a sudden they come in and they have an outage on MFA again, and it's like 
oh well we're going to move summit uh, you know uh, next month yeah. uh, okay there, yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a little phrase that we call an act of god which yeah. i mean mm-hmm. you know aside from your beliefs we'll just you know go with this force my uh, sure to, in terms of naming you know if you if you if you miss a flight or the flight doesn't take off because of weather or something and you're stuck in a city and you can't make a conference do you go crazy well sometimes we've all seen that person but generally speaking these things happen so riz is bad code considered an act of god under that is that <laughs> just asking just, for a friend yeah, just. I've just come to the point where I realize that I only have bad control code, over so much in my code. life, and there's What's certain things do? I do not, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To, to quote, to quote, <laughs> to quote Mike, shift happens. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that somewhere before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, well, let's jump into question number two. Um, Johan says, uh, using Word and the mailings function to send out a newsletter via email. Every email has a unique name at the greeting part of the email. It's awfully mm-hmm. clumsy to try and design a layout with text and pictures in Word. Yes, it is. And if I, I try to merch. use, yeah, <laughs> if I try to use a, a template for for Word sent as HTML, there are uh, bunches of pictures and shapes missing from the final email, which are fully visible in Word. Any tips on how to create a good looking email that doesn't change hugely depending on screen resolution, uh, zoom in, zoom out, things like that. Well, sometimes you actually want things to change, right? Based on if you're looking at like accessibility functions or if you're looking at um, like mo- more modern templates, they, they do change as you you know zoom, zoom out yeah. depending on the form factor. Am I looking at it on my phone or am I looking at it on, on a 32 inch monitor that I have on the side of me right now? I don't well, know how you fix that. Well, I know that right because you because you, you have the I mean gone are the days of the fixed width emails. I, you know, once in a while I receive one of those and think, "Wow, hello, 1997." <laughs> um, you get those emails, and so you have the dynamic. Then they scale based on the device and the things around that. But there are, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I used to try to use mail merge and do some things like a long time ago using Word. And it really hasn't gotten any better, which are why you have all of these third party solutions that that's all that they do. You have like MailChimp that have those templates. If you're using, if you've got your marketing platform, if you're using uh, Dynamics, I know has some out there, but you know, all the other platforms, the, the marketing platforms have templates that you can use as well. And my advice is don't stray from those templates. Yeah. And they're designed to be. You know, just fill in with the images and the text and the text blocks, and then don't try to do anything advanced beyond that. But the one other piece of advice, if you're looking for something that's unchanged, you're doing a newsletter, save it as a PDF and send people to PDF. Well, and part of the thing is, is when you're dealing with Word, it's just like Outlook. Are you embedding the images? Because you talked about missing pictures and shapes. So are they being embedded or are they being linked? Because if they're being Mm -hmm. linked, it all depends on what the recipient can can <clears throat> receive and, and whether, you know, all, everything around what the recipient can see. Whereas if they're being embedded, it's part of the mail itself. It's part of the, the actual, you know, piece of mail. So um, that, that makes it can make it really big and thereby yeah. cause troubles from that standpoint. So, yeah, yep. I know I people that have embedded, that embedded videos in email. Is that just yeah. ridiculous? Isn't that just? I mean, why would you do such a thing? <laughs> no, a good a good friend of mine. Um, some, of you, some of you may know. Well, you probably all know him, Todd Carter, from yeah. Microsoft, right? Mm-hmm. One of the things he 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 was alongside myself. He was a fellow instructor on the Microsoft Certified Master Program. And one of the things he always said, which resonates with me to this day, and he t- first told me this about fifteen years ago. Don't take a dependency you can't afford. So, put an image in a in a word, word document, and it's it's not embedded. It's actually just attached. Oh, it's like linked, and maybe it's somewhere stored in a SharePoint site somewhere, and you have an authentication problem like we had last week. Now all of a sudden nobody can see those images because no one can authenticate, even if they have permission. Does that advice so, also apply to children? Applies to everything. <laughs> Never take a dependency you can't afford, Christian. 
I've I right. found the workaround is saving saving your words as an MHTML file because that embeds the images. Because otherwise, when you create an HTML file, it creates a separate folder and the images are referenced in that. And if if yep. they're sending it out as a Word document and the pictures on their desktop, it's not going to find it when it hits their inbox. Right. So, but yeah, it does MHTML. It, it, it puts a CSS and everything in it separate, right? So yeah, the cascading scales and everything that, I mean, do anything in HTML, it bloats it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just yeah, takes I would, it. I would, I would, well, and to I, your I point, who was, I think it was Hal was talking about the size. You can't take your photographs that you took for, with your camera that are 2,400 by 6,400 pixels wide and yeah. put it in an MHTML email, right? We need to nope. right size Wait, those. Let's clarify that. People do insert those large files in there. They don't resize. Which is why they fail. Exactly. So that's right. And I found, um, I have to find it now, but um, there's an add-in to Windows that now lets you resize pictures, like by right-clicking and resizing them, not have to opening them in Paint. Picture resizer. Um, I think that's part of the Power Toys. Power Toys. That's what it was. So if you, uh, we'll, I'll find that and put yeah, a link. Find in the there. link. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. There. Well, even, even Outlook these days, though, you know, if you, if, well, say these days, been there for a while. If you if you attach an, an image file, it'll say, what, you know, do you want to do this, like, small, medium, or large? You know, original size, or it'll do that for you anyway, but, but uh, that's an attachment versus embedding. If it's a yeah. newsletter, you actually want the image visible versus... As and as long as you're resizing your images, remember to uh, to also add the... Uh, you know the the uh, you know appropriate tags and description to all of your images. That's actually this is my, put my marketing hat on. Is uh, uh, most people fail to do that? Add any of that other metadata to their images. There's a lost branding opportunity right there. Um, Who has the time? Come on. <laughs> That's right. Anybody anybody outside of marketing does not have the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Truth. All right. It's like it's like putting all the metadata in your in your uh, music. Who has the time to go in there? If it if the artists are the album, the you know all all that kind of stuff. I mean, does anybody really take the time to do that? I, I'm I, asking. I try to for accessibility <laughs> purposes, but other than that, yeah, I'm with you. Sometimes I'm like, I don't got time for that. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah, same problem. <laughs> On I mean, that I, note, yeah, I don't have time for this. I got to run, guys. <laughs> Love you all. <laughs> yeah. Take care, guys. See, all right, you, see you later, Eric. Take care, Eric. Take care, Chris. Well, let's jump into question number three. Uh, Ramey asks, uh, hello, does someone have a, an issue when uploading profile pictures in Delve? I upload a new profile pic, but I refresh the Delve page, and it disappears. Any idea? Did someone encounter the same issue? So I have to, to read that again. Because does, doesn't uh, doesn't Delve pull from uh, your Azure AD profile? Yeah, it, which comes it, from Exchange. Well, yeah, it can, it can, and then they can replace it. So the the company can keep can designate that it has to use a specific picture or allow you to add your own. But yeah, I'm, right. Yeah. So that that's my point is that if if the company doesn't allow that, it. it depending on what the company is set up, it could just automatically replace that or not allow that to be saved. So just so we're clear here, um, the exchange, the like the gal, uh, the gal is made up off of what it can pull from Active Directory or what can be is manually added as a contact because you can add a contact without it being associated with Active Directory, right? Because you can add like, you know, guests and external people and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't necessarily go up into Azure Active Directory, um, but when that stuff is pulled, it automatically goes into Delve, but then you have policies around Delve that can restrict what is displayed in Delve. So it may not display all of your extended attributes and, and everything else. It just might just put your name and your picture out there and that's it. And I know a lot of companies that have locked down the the ability to chain pictures. They say the I, I work with two of the companies that said, nope, we don't want our employees changing the picture. HR has to do that. Yep. So is, is there a file size limit that could be? Yeah, there is actually. And that's that's yeah. published. That's actually published uh, because uh, that that file actually sits inside of a field in Active Directory, so it's like it's embedded, and it's yeah. actually you know base sixty four encoded, so it's. That, that'll not, reject the image if you try to upload it 
like yeah. right there at the upload process. But I think that the first step of this is talk to your admin, find out you know what they what they allow because that might be the reason why it's rejected. And if it's not, that might identify some other issue that the admin needs to go investigate anyway. Yeah. Well, and my and my HR hat goes on. It's like what what is in the picture? <laughs> like maybe. <laughs> I always yeah. tell people, make sure it's a work appropriate picture, you know, being on the beach yeah. with a margarita in your hand it, in your job is probably not the best idea. So, Yeah, yeah. but then they, then they relax. Send me pictures, Sherry, right? <laughs> but, yeah, but then they relax it. If, I don't know if anybody here uses like Slack. Um, in Teams, you can't do it so much, but I mean, like Slack, you can throw whatever picture you want up there. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's jamming. Hal had his tunes kick in. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's jump to question number four. Uh, Umit says, uh, I have a Microsoft 365 Azure tenant where I have E3 business licenses. I want to require my users, which are not on Azure AD, the requirement to force using a Windows 10 password when using their laptops or phones. Uh, it should also go to lock screens after five minutes of inactivity. The users are only using their own laptops, so their personal laptops with my tenant subscription. It should stay uh, like a uh, bring your own device configuration. Where do I specify these policies? So if, if people are using their personal devices, um, they, it, unless you have management of those devices, I don't, I didn't think you could I enforce yeah. those kinds of policies no so that this is this is this is an intune um scenario with office 365 mm -hmm. and in order in order to manage the device the device needs to be registered and synced and the users need to be synced the users crit it's critical the users are also synced so they need to be synced into Office 365, and then you can you use Intune or Microsoft Endpoint Manager, as it's called these days, to um, to to to, to uh, when you enroll the device, whatever policies you've created in Intune will be applied to that device. Is that the same for me? You know, I have my personal iPhone, right? I enroll it in Microsoft, and we're pretty lenient in terms of our policies. Very strong in security but lenient in terms of what we can and can't do. You can have the devices where they're, you know, from all the way from being literally locked up kiosk devices to, um, you know, fully open, do what you like. But if you would then try to access any particular managed application, there is a set of security rules. Like if I, for example, I, I, I must have a six digit pin on my phone in order to use Microsoft Outlook on my phone. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no, you can't use it. Um, so it's in tune is where that happens. That's where the policies are. But no, you, you can't. You you can't not have the users enrolled. It, it's just not a thing. That's like trying to, you know, assign me a password when you don't know what my identity is. How do you do that? You can't. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Uh, question number five. Uh, Shreya says uh, a quick question on SharePoint 2013 server. Often when Windows patching is done, I can see that SharePoint patches get installed, which I don't want. Is there any way to avoid this? Does the Windows patching require SharePoint update as well? Uh, the short answer to that question is no. The question, the one I would add to that is a question back to Shreya. I'm, I'm, I'm apologies. I'm assuming it's female. Sounds like a female name. Are you using Windows Update or like automatic updates, or are you downloading your updates and installing them? Because if you're using automatic updates, there is a chance you'll pull down the occasional window SharePoint patch as well, uh, especially if it's a security patch. You're gonna, it's gonna come down. Well, and I, I will preface that um, too is that if you're using WASAS, you can control that. So yep. they may consider you putting WASAS in uh, Windows Update Services um, server, so they can they can actually put a policy 
Don't. What are you laughing about, Christine? I'm just thinking that it's that 90s. Are you using wasas? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just where my mind goes. <laughs> that could be like a new thing. Why is yeah. Microsoft not capitalizing on that? Wasas. Are you using wasas? I'm wondering how much coffee Christian's already had today. <laughs> I'm not about the coffee. (laughs) (laughs) What's in the coffee? I don't know why that makes me a little more scared that you haven't had any coffee and you have that much energy on a Monday morning. (laughs) Uh, I'm just, I'm that passionate about answering community questions here every (laughs) Monday morning. Every Monday morning. That's right. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And patching is something that, like, whether it's, it doesn't really matter what platform it is. SharePoint's obviously sensitive because SharePoint has security patches, it has product patches, it has service packs, it has all of the things, right? Like like a lot of other platforms. So I think, you know, WASUS, yes, absolutely, um, would make perfect sense and makes absolute sense inside a, inside a business organization for patching everything, really, when you think about it in terms of what's approved and what's not. Um, so if they use, like I say, going back to the, they're using just regular Windows update. If you go into Windows and just click update, you now find find all updates, you're going to get everything. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's the thing to be aware of. And especially you will get security patches for SharePoint if that's the case. So think about your patching strategy versus just blind, no, blind is the wrong word, but just going into it like using the defaults. Don't just use the defaults. Yeah. All right. Um, question number six, Ryle says, what PowerShell version should I use in 2021 and why? It's an, he's asking as a newbie. I'll take, I'll take that one. Uh, sure. I do because I, you know, half of my work is done with PowerShell. Um, so the, the answer, it depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why All I right, say question number the reason why I say that is because uh, PowerShell 5.1, which is still shipped with Windows Server, um, is based off of .NET Framework 4.5, and or .NET Framework, not necessarily 4.5, but earlier. So, and PowerShell version seven, everybody wants to forget about PowerShell version six, which was called PowerShell Core. And that's no longer, you know, anywhere. Uh, PowerShell 7 is based off of, uh, of uh, .NET Core. And <clears throat> there's a big difference there, right? Is that Windows Server uses the 5.1, which is the lowest common denominator, uh, which allows you to run a lot of modules and a lot of scripts that have not yet updated to .NET Core. So it gives you a much uh, wider breadth of, of, of modules and uh, scripts that people have written over the years, and you can still use them, okay? That's not to say that they won't work in the newer versions of PowerShell, like PowerShell 7, uh, but it all depends on how they were how they were coded, all right? So some of them were specifically coded in C-sharp for .NET framework. They will not work in .NET Core. That's just the way it is. That's the way the, the frameworks work. Um, so uh, my advice is, I use both. So my advice is to get, you know, fire up Windows Terminal. If you haven't used Windows Terminal, you really should, uh, because that is becoming now a, the default terminal in Windows 10, uh, the next uh, build that comes out for the public. If you're on Insiders, you know this, uh, Windows Terminal is going to be the default, and you can fire up multiple sessions. And multiple sessions means you can have PowerShell 5.1 running side by side with PowerShell 7. Um, and I run both. It depends on what I'm doing, the work type of work I'm doing. Um, PowerShell 7 gives you all these new fancy new features of PowerShell. It gives you a lot more flexibility with the commandlets and things like that, but it doesn't give you a lot of the backward compatibility um, that you can use in 5.1. Good. Is that, does that work? There we go. All right. That's, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, question number seven, uh, Ulrika says, uh, please help since Monday afternoon, I've not been able to reach all the files in Teams. I am the owner. My members get the same message when they try to open files. This is that they might be removed or we are not authorized to see them. I found the SharePoint site and see all the files, 
but cannot open them. Something about the SharePoint server can't be found. Is this related to last week's authentication one? As expertly yeah. described by, by, by Mike. <laughs> They're they're saying uh, you know since Monday afternoon I don't know what was the span of the outage it wasn't uh, over multiple days uh, yes, was it, it oh yeah it was oh, oh was it, it was yeah okay yeah it actually, it's actually was on Friday it was actually still a problem in EMEA mm. yeah yep did that start on Monday though did they start experiencing it? was it, it over depends, the course of the whole week because it's a wave right so it started yeah. in EMEA later than the U S it started in the yeah. U S first it ended in the U S first. It was still going on in EMEA at the time. It ended in EMEA the last, at the end. So it was the I had, I had a demo environment that I was working on trying to set it up for Tuesday for an event, and that when the outage hit, and um, then I tried to go back and use that same demo environment a couple of days later, it was still corrupted. Mm. Yeah. So I couldn't use it anymore. So something happened, whatever happened in that space. Because it, it had a ripple effect too. It wasn't only the MFA, but some people were in working the fix went in and they were still doing things that caused, you know, some corruption mm. uh, because they tried to back yeah. it out when people are still using the service. So there was corruption elements. And obviously if it's an authentication issue, you got you, if you already, if you already had your token, right, you were, you were, didn't have to create a new token. Therefore you could continue to work. And then at some point your token would expire and then you couldn't get a new one. Mm. So you would, it would fail. Like if you're midway creating a document, it would fail to save, for example. Those kind of things would happen. So I think I suspect this question and um, I encourage the person that wrote the question to come back if they don't think that was the issue and if they're still having the problem, please come back. Otherwise, I suspect it was connected to that, that scenario that happened last week. So just to summarize what you just said there, Neil, are you saying, have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> Basically, yeah. So Don't we always? <laughs> I have to, I have, I have to, I have to reboot, reboot my laundry machine every now and again because I have problems. <laughs> yeah, my favorite reboot uh, uh, stories are back in the beginnings of what is now Office 365, and people didn't under, and that was like every SharePoint admin oh. remembers that. Yeah, you know, restarting the servers. And uh, and then you'd have newer people coming into the SharePoint world saying, this is a legitimate thing. Like, everybody's OK with this. Like, <laughs> no, no one's OK with it. It's just the reality that we live in here. But uh, how do you reboot yeah, yeah. the cloud, Christian? How do you reboot the cloud? Um, oh, I can I can answer that. <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> well, you got to remember, Mike, I work. I was part of the original Office 365 engineering team, right? I helped build BPOS D build B plus S, build Office 365. And as, I'm not joking, we legitimately had to reboot the machines. Oh yeah, really? Sometimes sometimes it's your only option, right? Uh, oh, so, it's, so, it's so diversified now, no, Neil. How does that happen? I mean, they literally have to, if they wanted to do that, they'd have to take outages across the oh, service fabric that would yeah. extend. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. I'm talking 2010. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I was in that team back in 2010, right? So yeah. Well, but then, before that, it was so, actually physical machines, and we yeah. log into those machines, right? As escalation it, engineers and fix stuff. So I had a, a, that a and, not, and Neil, you remember him, that, but uh, you know, I had a great conversation where I, my eyes were kind of open to some of that back in like 2007, 2008, um, with uh, Derek Ingalls, um, who owned oh. all, the, all those environments and was responsible for those in his team, and and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, it was, I, I, I saw how some of the cake was made and it startled me. So there's, th there's a, there's a, there's a session that Steve Walker and I delivered at, um, it was Ignite New Zealand 2015. And it was, the, the description was in a view inside the sausage factory. And we went, we, we revealed ev everything we were allowed to reveal. Let's put it that way. <laughs> These things, I mean, the, 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 the platform today, as you said, Mike, right, it's a very, it's a much more holistic platform. Everything's connected, everything works together. Back then, it, it really wasn't. Well, it was, it, like, it, was it, the, it was enterprise software that was being opened up to multiple enterprises it was a new thing so microsoft was 
you know, I, I think as sometimes happens, you've probably heard this, the marketing was a bit ahead of the reality on the engineering <laughs> side of what could be always. done. <laughs> Not just, just Microsoft, yeah. everybody, every, every Correct. company does that. Correct. Um, but uh, yeah, so Fired. it's 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 amazing to see where it was. Yeah, no, I mean, I had I had customer number two on BPOS D, and it failed outright from a technology standpoint. Oh, you were so, that, oh okay. So it was a financial services company, a big one out of Connecticut. Um, the first company, and most people know this, is a trivia question: Who was the first customer on Office three sixty five, which was the BPOS D um, platform, the dedicated platform? It was Energizer. Energizer. Yep. Yeah. I had customer number two. It did not go well. So. I did it. I did an entire session with them when we trying when we and they were, they were a good customer to be fair. When we moved from uh, 2007 to 2010 SharePoint in B plus D. The, everything changed, right? Because we did we started to integrate fast search. Mm -hmm. We started to change everything. The ranking models all changed. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks going through why their search didn't work anymore. Yeah. And it's not that it didn't work, it's just that they that they're everybody, not just them, everybody's processes changed. You had to change how you searched. And it was, well, a, the problem, it was a long, a long, long effort. The the problems back in that that era, you know, I mean, we were because this customer, that was still the twenty three, the two thousand three to two thousand seven transition. So it's when, mm -hmm. you know. All this stuff was brand brand new. So that was 2006 was when this project was going on. And right. they were they were not a Microsoft shop. They were moving to all things Windows. So that added to the complexity and the emotion of the employees. <laughs> uh, oh, that, yeah. you know, so that's a that's a full time job right there. Just you know, moving people off of other. They were uh, I believe they were a Lotus Note shop and over to the Microsoft sphere uh, and that if that's not difficult enough and then to also move off of all of their collaboration platforms to this yet unfounded solution you know uh, uh, it was uh, that was still when we were called MMS before BPOS oh. even came around so uh all right fun, well, let's, fun games. yeah fun like stories of old yes question number eight Ahmed says how can I authenticate Wi-Fi users by using Azure Active Directory? Uh, need more information here. Um, is it is it a guest hotspot that you're talking about? Is it like on a Cisco device where you set up the the disclaimer that uh, you know when a Wi-Fi guest comes in, they have to click the button saying they accept you know, your policies and they have to type in an email address like in a hotel Wi-Fi or a room number or whatever? Um, or is it just authenticating to the network for corporate network users that are already in AD? Because that doesn't that doesn't require any. I mean, that's just they're just part of the network. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure that, where that, this question is coming from. And there's then the other thing to think there are what's the platform uh, Uni Unify. There's a bunch of stuff out there. There's a bunch Ubiquity. of SSO solutions that use that can use Azure Active Directory. But I think actually, can, if you're th if you're talking about just uh, how do I authenticate? Because you're not. Uh, one of the things I always think about this when I think about this this scenario is, I'm not necessarily authenticating me as a user. I'm authenticating my device, right? I'm allowing my device access to the network. So w w which is it? What what are we talking about here? And sometimes it's a, you know, I've got a Wi-Fi user They're on Wi-Fi. I want to authenticate them with AD. I want to authenticate them to a SaaS solution. I want to then that. Yeah, more information. Yeah, that's kind of the what is it? What is the exact scenario here? Which we do not and I know. So. <laughs> I know my net. I know my Netgear router that sat around the corner right here is not going to integrate with Azure AD. <laughs> so that, I need I need a password for that. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, 
All right. Uh, question number nine. Chris asks, uh, I have an issue with a Power Automate workflow where I have Microsoft Forms as the trigger, which ultimately populates a SharePoint list item with the responses and attachments. Considering Forms has a 10 item attachment limit, We've found through testing that when the attachments are added to the SharePoint list item, only five of the 10 attachments are actually added to the list. Now, is Forms still technically in preview? I don't know. I can't help with this question, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't even use Forms. Yeah, I don't think it is, I don't know. I'm gonna open up and look at it. I mean, within within my team, we use it all the time for collecting like feedback and stuff. Yeah, but I've not I've not gone down. I mean, I've never seen no. an attachment. No, I think it's it all it's not saying beta or preview or anything. So I think it's fully out there. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's um, what could be failing with the attachments. I mean, if there's if the attachments don't meet certain criteria, if there's other criteria around what can be attached and it's the the you know unaccepted types, if it's if the SharePoint list that it's going to only accepts certain content types, um, that could also cause that failure. Um, like if you're trying to attach images and it's an unsupported image type. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, anything else around that? If there are there any other limitations on the Power Automate side for that that would restrict that? But yeah, I don't know. This is this is one of those I feel like where we'd need to go and play around. There's not an obvious answer. Uh, we'd have to go and test that out, but. I don't know. Any other thoughts? I, I don't have experience. I don't know. Sorry. All right. Hal, you, do you have all the answers for us? He doesn't have a voice right now. He's he's muted, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. I must have muted myself. Uh, no, not right off hand, unfortunately. Okay. All right, we'll move on. Um, Question number 10, Zeke asks, uh, anyone can help me uh, how I can share a folder. I cannot share it on SharePoint due to it reached the threshold. However, when a list view shows more than 5,000 items, you may run into a list view threshold error. You may run into an error or he is running into an error is my question there. I don't know, the, the, the grammar on this one's pretty, pretty rough, but. Um, okay. It, you know, I would say, I would say, okay, I want to just, I'm just going to throw this out there. Yeah. Is he sharing with like multiple individual people? Because if he is, he should start looking at the opportunity to use Azure AD groups instead, right? Instead of sharing a list with 5,000 people, share it with an AD group or multiple AD groups. The, the different groups have different levels of permission. So therefore, you're not look. You're no longer going to hit the five thousand item limit. You're going to be much more controlled in terms of the permission scopes. Yeah. If it's a number of items in the list is over five thousand, then well, no, we've in, we've changed that limit significantly actually, but that shouldn't be a specific problem in modern, especially if it's SharePoint Online. I don't know if it's SharePoint on prem or SharePoint Online. Um, but there's a there's a number of, again. It, I, I hate saying this. It's an it's another more information question, right? Yeah, the list view. I'm assuming they're getting the the little yellow bar that pops up at the top that says restricted view, that kind of thing. Um, think about more folders. Think about Azure Active Directory permissions, uh, uh, permissioning at the, with a security group versus individual users. I think back to Steve Pes. Remember Steve Pesca wrote mm -hmm. that document back in the day that talked about how to manage large lists. That's still out there. 
it's that that document that 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 blog post I think is still out there. So those I kind of about things Steve. I think about. Well, that's the name I haven't. You can't heard forget about. about Steve. No, no, I remember Steve, of course. I just haven't heard that so, name in a while. Well, th- there's a reason for that. The reason is he, he he when he left Microsoft, right? He he created Office 365 Mon, his company. That was his company that he he built with his past, and then he sold it. And he's probably driving around Nevada somewhere in his in his in his um, whatever car he's driving these days like super souped up machine with, with his millions of dollars in his pockets <laughs> <laughs> and on him because he deserves it he was a yeah. great guy <laughs> grandpa as we called him because he was always the oldest of us all <laughs> in the yeah. ship well, there's a picture of him out on facebook just with him and his dog yep he rides his bike and he, he didn't even he, 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 he cycled from east coast to west coast across the us raising money for charity as well at some point i seem to recall there's been a couple microsoft folks that have done that um mm-hmm. but uh yeah i i remember that uh, so i don't know if you ne- ever knew uh bill staples he was oh a yeah VP. i knew bill yeah. so good friend mm-hmm. of mine he was my next door neighbor there and so he's here in utah as well now He's a SVP for some DevOps company out of San Francisco now, but he, um, you know, he he and his wife did that cross country cycling mm-hmm. and uh, took pictures along the way of that that whole experience. But um, Forrest Gump. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, Forrest Gump. I don't know. I've driven on a lot of those highways that they covered out of Washington State and making it just down here to to uh, uh, to Utah. And uh, I mean, I was nervous for them on some of those roads, but I know how I drive. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, let's uh, jump into question 11. So we got another 20 minutes. Um, So Zeke says, uh, anyone can help me how I can, oh, that was the last one. 11, uh, Ferris says, hi, I need help on Power Apps. I want to create a copy of existing record in Power Apps that is connected to SharePoint list. Once I copy the record, I would want to make edits to some of the fields and then save the record as new. I got nothing. No depths on power apps here. Anyone? Mike? Al? Yeah, we're going to punt on that one. Sorry. Is that a telepathy question? Do. Sorry. It's not. It's it's a <laughs> power apps for this group. The power current apps. group is, is, a, is a telephony related question. Yes. <laughs> Um, 12, Shiri asks us, I have a SharePoint online modern site. I want to remove the breadcrumbs. Is there a way to do it? Why would you want to remove the breadcrumbs? Uh, breadcrumbs. I remember when breadcrumbs were an option. They were a widget, but now they're not. Mm-hmm. Or a web part, sorry. Yeah, no, the breadcrumbs along with the, what are they we call it, the mega menu? Those are kind of just locked in now. Well, Mega is that, Menu's not, but is that why? Because you want to be able to serve up information. You don't want people going and navigating and going other places. You want to have them consume that information there and then depart. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, and maybe that's part of the the announcement that Mike made earlier, right? You know, thinking about using breadcrumbs versus like having all of the information, so you're just seeing more more targeted information. The breadcrumb just exists. It's a way to move around. Um, I, 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 no, I don't know. I don't. I don't think you can remove it though. I don't think it's an option. You probably have to deploy a custom site to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, if you're going and in, in creating a curated experience for people, a communication site, uh, you know, hub site with kind of all those things, pieces around there. And are delivering, you know, what you want people to see in the flow of that. I mean, personally, I still want to have the ability to go do a deep dive or go, you know, wherever I'm finding that information. And if I'm finding a bunch of sites that have the breadcrumbs removed, and I, maybe I want to, you know, go up and find the source of the information of this subsite that's created, and you remove that ability. So um, I'm a fan of bre- breadcrumbs for that reason. If I'm just scanning, looking for information of what was curated 
that's great to have that organized versus having to go and do a detailed search and dig to find stuff every time. So I'm a fan of having the presented catered uh, content experience, but I want to have that ability to go and dig in if needed. Yeah, so. All right, uh, question 13. Thomas, why do I get the following message during a chat? Due to org policy changes. So I'm assuming this is within Teams. Due to org policy changes, mm -hmm. some chat and calling features are no longer available. Continue your conversation here. Then I cannot continue that chat dialogue. Has anybody experienced that? I have. Uh, and, and yeah, so I've had that where it's, it's broken and I go back in and where it's an authentication issue with like my my profile is as, as I switch between multiple tenants but leave chats open. I believe that's what it causes that issue in the, what I've experienced that this is the same thing this person is talking about. Um, and but when I refresh that chat that window, then it reconnects and I'm able to get right back into that conversation. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll get my guitar in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a jam. We'll just well, maybe that's we'll close out every one of these with a jam session. Like yeah. that, you know, I, I jump on the keyboards or grab the bass, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll just go. But uh, but I think that's what I believe that's what's happening there. If there's a disconnect, if it's not able to identify that you're you as part of that, and that's where you'll right. get that uh. that error. So I don't know if that's uh, Mike or Hal, if you've experienced that issue with that error message in Teams, where you get disconnected from a chat. Nope, not me. Hal's the one with the chat history, so. I think the thing is, is it is it actually an error message or is it just a notification? Like that something's changed. Because um, I, I get that in Outlook, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll that in Outlook, this is not right? I'll, that I see, I'll say your, like. your administrator has changed some settings. You need to reset. Yeah, well, with this one, right. So there's there's one where there's like the features not available anymore, and this is different than what what I brought up is slightly different for what what uh, yeah. Thomas mentions. D get the messages due to org policy changes. Some chat and calling features are no longer available. Continue your conversation here, but then can't get to that chat to continue it. So oh, so that isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's. That's, that's, definitely that's not at all what I'm seeing. Yeah, so if that's, and I guess the, the follow up questions would be is it from that single chat? Are you having that, experiencing that across multiple chats? Because, yeah, that, that, so I get a, a weird, a similar message when there's that, that disconnect, especially moving between um, multiple profiles and leaving chats open. This looks like uh, something that happened from a, an org policy change. And but in both cases, it says, you know, continue your conversation here. And then that kind of infers like I can click on it and it takes me to a place where I can continue that. And if he's saying that nothing is continuing and he's he's locked out of that chat. That's a different problem. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of weird. Yeah, I would talk to the admin and the if the admin is equally uh, confounded by that issue then to uh, log a ticket. So yeah, I didn't know what else to what else to tell you, Thomas. Um, question number 14. Uh, John says, I'd like to put call me or message me links in my email signature for members of my organization to contact me through Teams. Can anyone think uh, if there's a way to trigger these Teams functions by URL? Yep, just put it in the chat window. Twice, bizarrely. <laughs> All right. Just, that is your, that's the HTML link, and that will send you to your chat or call. Yeah, I think there's a, a blog post 
from like three years ago. Um, I think I, I had that at one point open. We didn't get to this question. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a couple of people that have blogged about this like back in 2017, mm -hmm. I think, uh, of that, that capability. So it's kind of a, a known way to oh, yeah, go into that. Yeah, this isn't this isn't me being smart. This is me using reusing somebody else's knowledge, just for just for acknowledgement there. Yep. So we'll provide that link in the blog post as well. Yep. So that's a great thing to have out there. Uh, question fifteen. Dan says, uh, "What will happen if an owner deletes the team's group from Exchange?" Oh all kinds of bad things yeah um, all the pointers and everything go away i know that mm -hmm. so you're saying don't do it don't probably do it. not a good idea yeah. i mean you, you you yeah it's definitely not a good idea you can rebuild it just like the six million dollar man steve austin right we can rebuild him it's pot it's possible to put back together but only if you know what was in there in the first place. As Hal said, right, the pointers are going to go. There's a bunch of stuff in, a, in an exchange group that is not just about users and missions. There's there's much more to it than that. Um, I would suspect that. Yeah. Yeah. So the so let's talk content. So the content that's stored in the SharePoint side still there. Mm -hmm. The yep. content, the the conversations that were associated with that that are stored in Exchange. Those are still there, but they're now they don't have that connector ID. There's no the permissions. Basically, the permissions are gone. Well, I mean, permissions to the content will still be there because that's based on Active Directory, right? Or Azure AD. Um, but the teams, the teams. I'm trying to, and I'm probably oh, the thing that would be lost. The the primary thing that would be lost is that connectivity between all of the people. And the content, so yeah. you would lose, you would lose the context would be gone if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. So Every, everything, all the all the all the artifacts remain, but now they're no longer connected. But what happens to the team? So if you have a team that's associated with that group, the team anything, still remains. I think. I yeah. Think. That, that's but, interesting. But, no one, but but nobody will be able to like discover the because if you think about how. The discovery of a team occurs like if i if i go into teams and i'm like oh i want to find this team someone says go join this team i'm not gonna be able to find it anymore it's gone right the 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 the, the am, positional pointer if you like for that team is no longer there i am gonna go i'm gonna take this one as homework and i i think this is an interesting problem i want to understand again i i'm confident like we've been saying i'm confident in what happens to the components but i want to know what happens the rest of the experience if there's something else we're missing in the team side of things so i'm going to go and blow something up and see what happens oh boy. and uh yeah so <laughs> well that's the benefit of having now my uh my former company now just my personal tenant it's just become my pure demo tenant and so there's nothing business critical on it um and so i can go do things like this but i definitely have some uh, groups and some sites and things that are uh, out there, some teams that have multiple people and internal, external, and and uh, I'm interested to know what happens uh, end to end. So I'll go do some research and provide some links as well. I'll report back on it in two weeks when we're back together, but I'll likely blog mm -hmm. on it between now and then. Um, all right. Well, we got to question 16 with the question from Dynamike. 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 Uh, Dynamite. Uh, so he asks, uh, hi, everyone. I, I have a SharePoint list that is growing past 5,000 items every three months or so. The filters on the list is impacted every time the items exceed 5,000. Is there a way to allow the list to increase and not impact the filters? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, well, I guess a lot depends on what the filters are. I mean, the, 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 my gut response would be no. So the filters are always going to be impacted, right? Because there's always, 
the filters I'm assuming are based on metadata. And you know whether it's like a, a date range or a alphanumeric filter, they're always going to be impacted as it gets bigger. So it might it might need to be think about what are the filters that we're using, and how are we what, how are we visualizing the list is probably a more more appropriate question. But again, it's it uh, it's another one of those need more information. I think. Mm. My, my gut response, no, there's not. Your filters are going to be impacted. The question is, what are your filters? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know where else to go with that. It's just, I'll go back to my favorite Jeff Teeper quote, reduce your requirements. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, hey, that's a key part of uh, architecture and design is, is understanding the limitations of the technology and then designing experience where if you're continually running into this, then make a change. Like, how are people actually using that? Um, if you're constantly running into this and you need to have, you know, this list that's exceeding, maybe this is something that um, you need to pull it out of SharePoint. Maybe this is something that you, you know, you've got out in Azure stored that you're accessing building like a dashboard in Power BI and you're just accessing that data in a different way. It just depends on what you're doing. Yeah. All right. Um, possibly the last question. We'll see here. Uh, uh, 17 uh, February. It's a great name. Um, hi all, I'm using SharePoint 2013 with the custom list that has approval. Can the approval be accessed via mobile? I tried accessing the team site in my mobile browser, but I can't open it. The mobile browser view is activated. Come on, Mike, answer some of these SharePoint questions. Uh <laughs> 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 not my, not my, my zoo, you know, that's just, yeah. Can the approval be accessed via mobile? Is it, uh, have they tried using the SharePoint app versus just the browser? That's, that would be know, a great question. That's, that's, that's another option, right? The SharePoint app, they actually they just updated it last week. Hmm. So I would consider using the SharePoint app and see if it works that way. I when I use my browser in my, my mobile my phone, I I generally always flip to the full version versus the mobile version of any website I access. Maybe that can help as well. However, if it can't be accessed, then maybe that's something that needs to be flagged as a oh okay. User voice is gone now, but well going. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if if it's if it's truly truly broken, I would say if I'm unsure if you're actually listening, if you're on, if you're on this call, you get the feedback. No, not Hanshu, sorry. Um, February. 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 Um, get back to us because if there's a bug there, I I would I would be happy to open an internal bug ticket if that's actually a genuine failure in the mobile experience. Oh, wait, no, SharePoint 2013. Oh, 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 so it's not online. That's going to be a harder, that, that, that's a harder argument to have. Oh, so yeah. It's on-prem. Good, good point. Boy, what a crappy, know. what a crappy mobile browser experience that is to then log uh, in yeah uh, so you could have uh, you know so the the mobile browser view is activated um uh, there could be other permissions or restrictions in place by accessing via device um i mean it could be a slew of other problems yeah and you're not going to get support for that there's <laughs> there's you know SharePoint 2013 is already in extended support it's, it there's certainly not going to be any help for that so if it doesn't work all I can say is, as a Microsoft employee, I'm sorry, 
it doesn't work and, and and i know i say that flippantly and kind of i don't mean it that way if it, if it doesn't work today it probably never worked ever um and your answer the answer to the question is probably no yeah if you can't find it yep it's funny how we just glossed past that. I did the same thing. Uh, SharePoint 2013. I know, we do all yeah. I know. Well, I'm also appreciative, though, that February actually gave the version number. Yeah. And, and actually, so that gives us the indication that it's SharePoint on premises. It's not SharePoint online. Therefore, it, it allows us to. What did you said? The Jeff Tipa comment like, yeah, narrow your requirement. requirements. Yeah. Yeah. It, it allows us to it allows us to scope the scope the response better. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, we are we are at time here, and really appreciate everybody for uh, for participating. So, Mike, Hal, Neil, of course, Eric, and Sherry. Sean is dead to us. Sharon <laughs> this week is dead to us. Um, but again, we will not be back next week because we all have the uh, MVP summit happening. But we will be back on April fifth, Monday, April fifth at eight a.m. Pacific. And we'll do this again. So uh, feel free to uh, ping us via social. You can find us out there. You use the hashtag um, O365Hours. And we'll see any questions that are posted there. Uh, otherwise, we'll pull things off of the Facebook communities and the tech uh, community sites, unanswered questions as well. So uh, we'll do as many as yeah. possible. But don't ping me in Facebook because I'm in Facebook jail. Oh, <laughs> apparently I said oh. something naughty <laughs> oh, again, oh dear. again, I again, I got, I got, I got, I got, I'm up, I'm up to my seven day ban now. Well, that's why, again, just as we close out here, I've got the disclaimer back up in the live feed. So <laughs> that's just always important to, to remember that maybe we should put something about specifically about Neil's uh, occasional Facebook prison. Yeah, uh, you don't, wanna, don't follow Neil. <laughs> no, don't click on don't click on what well the most important on. thing though is if you ping me i can't ping you back so yeah. just understand that right <laughs> no worries well thanks everybody for participating and again for those that are interested uh the recordings will all go up on the collab talk youtube page uh over the course of the day it'll likely be tonight i got a busy day ahead of me but we'll go and compile every question that we attempted to answer and every topic and i'll have that link list up and you can also find those all out as well as past episodes out on buckleyplanet.com on my blog and you can't miss the office hours logo on those posts and find it's i've tried to make it as convenient as possible anything that we mention like third-party links microsoft content links all of those links are in the blog post as well, so check it out. And with that, guys, then I'll cue the music and we'll right. fade out and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Let the light shine through